Hey, Matt and Dom, thank you for coming in today. And, you know, you both have just uh, tremendous backgrounds. Dom, from uh, your early uh, sort of work with KPMG, and then uh, Matt, with your experience in, you know, working on Wall Street to uh, your family operations to then becoming quite a notable uh, investor. So, um, so really, uh, really appreciate you sharing some of your insights with my audience. Thanks for having us. Okay, you know, one of the questions uh, in my audience is always interested is, uh, you know, what are some of the inflection points that make these wonderful careers that you both have? So we'll start with you, Dom, uh, maybe one or two things that really changed your life and made who you are, made you who you are today. Sure thing. Yeah, the, the big inflection point for me was roughly five, six years ago when I made the decision to leave my original job at KPMG, uh, working on the accounting and finance practice, um, to work on technology companies instead. So I worked with a lot of early stage companies in that Toronto Waterloo corridor, uh, also worked with some emerging managers. And shortly after, I met Matt as he was starting up Ripple Ventures. And that was a great inflection point for me to really take a stab into that uh, career path for venture capital, given my personal experiences. Uh, as well as starting the Ripple X Fellowship um, roughly five years ago as well, shortly after I joined Ripple. Um, I started that program because of my personal experiences trying to help underserved students, founders, and aspiring VCs get equal access to education, network, job opportunities, and even funding. Um, and a big inflection point in that program and for us as a fund was after all of the hard work with, that we put in over four or five years to be able to generate real tangible results helping Students get into venture capital roles. We've placed over 75 students into those types of roles. We've helped student founders raise over 60 million in financing uh, after the program. And we've been doing a lot of uh, diversity work to help democratize access through our online course as well. So a big inflection point in that was getting the backing from the Royal Bank of Canada um, into our program to be able to have us a lead sponsor and a lead flagship sponsor for us to scale the operations and, and, and the insights. Yeah, that's a great uh, background, and I could see all of that, um, you know, shaped to who you are. And I guess one of the key inflection points was really just meeting and we're now working with uh, Matt. So, how about yourself, Matt? You know, what were those things that really made you who you are today? Yeah, sure. So, thanks again for having us. You know, I grew up in a family that was uh, small business entrepreneurs running a produce and florist business uh, in Toronto, Canada. Uh, saw the inefficiencies and the waste in that business growing up as a child, working, you know, in the store, going to the farmer's market with my parents early in the morning, uh, and just questioning a lot of the things that they could have done better to make the business more successful, but also recognizing that they were just trying to, you know, put food on the table and go every day and surviving. Um, and so I ended up going to school for finance and economics um, and learned about capital markets and the institutional investing world and was fortunate to get a job working on the trading desk for the Royal Bank of Canada, first in Toronto in 2005, and then down in New York in 2000, in the global financial crisis, which obviously was a very interesting time to say the least. But luckily, working for a Canadian bank, uh, we weathered the storm quite well and saw a lot of great opportunities and met with some of the greatest investors on Wall Street, you know, global financial institutions, uh, hedge funds, and the likes, and understanding how capital was moving around the public markets, how liability was treated on the balance sheet of the bank, and also just how hedge funds were coming up with interesting investment strategies, uh, and all the things in between. But really, my interest in startups and technology happened when I came back to Toronto in 2012-13, and connected with some old university friends who were looking at starting uh, a tech company at the time when there really was not a huge vibrant ecosystem for startups at the very early stages in Toronto, let alone the rest of Canada. And so I wrote a check for $50,000 to help start the business. It was called Turnstyle Solutions and it did Wi-Fi marketing analytics. And so I helped that business, uh, not as a founder, but as a founding investor to help them get the business off the ground and learned all the things that a startup typically goes through when they don't have a lot of capital, when they don't have a lot of people working around the table, and all the things that can kill them at the very beginning of a startup journey. Unfortunately, we were able to get the business off the ground and grow it into a 50-person company with a several million in recurring revenue, profitable by the end, and a finan uh, financing uh, you know, exit to Yelp for $30 million uh, cash that acquired the business. And uh, that event really changed my life. Uh, and led me down this path of becoming an angel investor, 
and then eventually a institutional a venture capital fund focusing on early stage. And that's where Dom and I connected over five years ago now. So that was the biggest inflection in my life for sure. So man, let's continue with this. I mean, you, you, you described this sort of, um, uh, you know, family sort of background and then you went into Wall Street and then you invested in Turcell Solutions. You had a great exit. You became a really successful angel investor. And then that sort of launched into Ripple. Is that how Ripple was uh, sort of? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was always sort of, um, you know, hanging around with other people who are looking at starting tech companies, you know, in the middle of that, I lived in Boston uh, for a couple of years working for a fintech company as a director of enterprise sales. So actually working as an operator, selling large enterprise SaaS contracts to global financial institutions and had just hanging around uh, other incubators and angel investors out of MIT and Harvard and Cambridge. Uh, but I really uh, took a lot of the capital that I had made from the sale of Turnstile and deployed it back into angel investments because a lot of friends were, you know, seeing the success that we had with Turnstile and saying, Hey, do you mind helping us, you know, do the same thing you did there with, uh, you know, just advice. But I didn't really believe in just giving advice if I really didn't mean what I said. And so I ended up putting capital behind my advice and became a meaningful, you know, part of their journey. And so I deployed almost a million dollars back into the ecosystem uh, in a bunch of different angel investments and was very fortunate that that fund zero, we called my angel portfolio, was over six and a half X DPI, distributions of paid in capital. So that was real meaningful returns. And then a bunch of family offices who I was friends with, very wealthy real estate families and philanthropic families across the country, asked if I would sit down with them and explain what I was doing because their families were starting to see how you know generation two, three, and four were seeing a lot of opportunities outside of their family businesses to invest in, but they really didn't know how to do diligence them or analyze them. And so I was a way for them to think about differently, uh, about different investment opportunities. And that's what eventually they said, well, why don't we just give you the money and you can run a venture fund with our capital alongside yours to make investments with a proper due diligence structure and operating background. And just as a follow-up then, I mean, normally when you set up an institutional fund, which is what a venture capital fund is, it's an institutional fund, right? Or it's considered institutional uh, versus angel investment or and so on. It, it, it almost sounds like, you, and usually a, a partner puts in capital uh, and so that it shows that you, you yourself have what we call skin in the game. It sounds like you put it more than the sort of like a one or two percent. Oh my, yeah. We were a third of the capital, 30% of the capital and fund one. Yeah. As a GP committed capital. And that was really important to me because I wanted to put my money where our mouth was obviously. And I didn't want to take on too much friends and family, high net worth capital before I knew what I was doing. You know, a lot of this sort of uh, venture capital game, if you will, it takes a long time to know if you're actually good at it. And I think there's a big difference by being a good angel investor where it's like one-offs, you know, can return the whole fund, which, you know, happens in venture capital, but there's a lot more hands-on involvement as an institutional investor, or there should be. And there's a lot more that happens along the way before you even know if you're good at this. You know, Dom and I have been at this for six years and we still don't really know if we're that good at it because our companies just take that long to become successful and to become breakouts. Now, luckily we've already returned half the capital from that very first fund in 2019, which has allowed us to be top 5% of performing funds at our stage and size and, and vintage. But we still have a long way to go. And some of our breakout companies are only at the Series B stage. You know, they're, they're well away from being an IPO or potential, you know, billion dollar company. Um, so that's why we think, you know, you got to do a lot in the betweens to know if you're actually good at this, but it takes just a long time. You know, that's a, there's a lot of valuable information and we'll try to mine that uh, and, and later on in this uh, conversation. Now, Dom, you indicated an inflection point for you was meeting Matt. So when did that occur? And then when did you join uh, Ripple? Yeah, I think that was just over six years ago. I was basically just on LinkedIn one day and Matt posted something about Ripple Ventures. And I think one of my friends ended up liking it. And then he also had uh, some posting uh, with uh, Waterloo and I found his phone number and I literally just like gave him, gave him a ring. And I was like, hey, like I saw your post. Um, I want to learn more about what you're building. This is my background. Uh, this is why I think it'd be a great fit for us to meet and partner together. 
Um, and I think like literally the the week after that, you sent me a, a job contract or like a, a job offer and we were off to the races together. So that's kind of how um, I met Matt originally. And, for, and, and you know, when you um, have this sort of connection, there's trust too. So it would take a little bit of time for Matt to get to know who you are and, and think that, you know what, I want to sort of engage with you more deeply. Can you describe that journey then? So now you could contract uh, with Matt, you're working with Matt, but when did that turnover point occur where you feel that, you know what, you're partners now? It's it's not kind of like you're an employee, right? Yeah, I think that inflection point happens some, sometime during fun too, right? Um, well, I joined actually as like a intern associate uh, analyst uh, running like deal sourcing and just like investments. Um, at that point, obviously, when I first joined, it was more so um, just like, yeah, I was an employee. I was working under Matt. Um, and as I started kind of leading some of my own investments, as I started taking some more stuff on top of the traditional investing path on the platform, uh, portfolio support, marketing, and the fellowship program, uh, I think over time, um, Matt, you can kind of chime in here too if you want, but we were able to build a lot of trust within each other. Um, and I think it took, yeah, like three, four years for that to kind of develop over time. And then there was an inflection point during fund two where um, it really felt more of like a true partnership um, and kind of evolution of that relationship. So Dom, I'm going to stay with you here. Now sure. you, and, and so six years ago, you met Matt, you, you uh, kind of reached out, Matt said, okay, let's come on board. You started working together and you were executing and delivering results with Matt. So that sort of cements that more of the relationship and then it becomes much stronger with fun too. But then uh, you started in 2019 Ripple X Fellowship Program, and you gave some of the some of the reasons why you thought diversity. It's a, there's not enough access throughout the country, and you built this ecosystem. And uh, this Ripple X Fellowship Program sounds really really interesting. So, how many people do you have? Uh, young people do you have in this program now? Yeah, so we kind of think of it in two different buckets. One is they we we have like a formal flagship program where we do a cohort uh, every uh, quarter with these students. Um, so every school semester or so, we get twenty to twenty five of the top students all across North America. We've ran that roughly fifteen times now, and our alumni base is close to five hundred. Um, and then on the other hand, we have an online course that we started to help democratize further for the people who didn't get into that flagship program, who still wanted the access to the education and network. Um, and in that, we just crossed 2000 students online uh, across 40 different countries now. So we kind of built up the base of a few thousand students that are very deeply integrated and involved with our fellowship ecosystem. So if students want to get uh, involved in this program, they can just like, what's, what's the onboarding application process? Yeah, so the core flagship program, we run that recruiting process uh, a month before the school semester starts. Um, so that is a very simple, easy process where you fill out a form, there's two or three interviews, and then we really judge you based off of uh, your interest and passion for building your company or your interest and passion in learning about venture capital. Uh, for the online course, that is a totally free and self-paced accessible course. So anyone at any time, no matter what background, uh, people um, in their late stages of their career who want to learn about venture capital are also signing up for that course. So that is a truly self-service uh, product. And then the third kind of platform piece that we have is the fellow fund, where we're cutting anywhere between 25K to 75K checks into student startups with diverse backgrounds building in the investment thesis areas of enterprise software and developer tools for our fund. Um, and, and that process is more of like an um, investment uh, application. So they got to fill out an application form. Um, they have to have a few conversations with us. There's a diligence process uh, because we are allocating capital that is a little bit more intensive. No, that's kind of fascinating. So you have, you have an early stage, almost like accelerator uh, program where you're cutting you know small checks to help uh, you know, uh, incentivize and, and help early sort of startup, which means you're really taking people from concept all the way over to translating that into some kind of commercial product, right? Exactly. Yeah, the, that's the goal for us to be able to give that um, accelerating step uh, that otherwise these students wouldn't have access to. And it's even like the students in Canada where they might go to a smaller college or university campus where they don't have 
like the community text and velocities of the world uh, in Waterloo, for example, um, where they don't have access to investors and funding. So we are able to basically fill that huge gap, especially in Canada, for these students who don't have access to getting that accelerant and that backing uh, to really take their company seriously and have the resources to go find customers, build the product, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I can really see the value of that program. Um, and the reason is, is I work with IEEE and I also work with ACM. And we're the largest uh, organizations in the world, both in the technology and computing science. And we have a lot of people interested on the entrepreneurship startup side. But how do you get involved? How do you how do you do it? And here you've got an online program that they could access. So I think that's really interesting to my audience. Now, Matt, you, you have Dom working as an associate. And and you hired him. What 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 made you think I want to hire this gentleman? Uh, I mean, when when Dom approached you sort of online and said, "Hey, I I want to do more with you." What what were the things that Dom? What were, so Matt, what were the things that Dom that made you think, "Hey, I, I want to give this uh, gentleman a chance"? Yeah, I think Dom's underselling himself as he usually does. But I think what happened really was I knew about the Waterloo co-op program because I went to a Dalhousie co-op program. So I knew how strong it was. And so when I was starting at the first fund, I wanted obviously someone to come on, work with me part-time to get to know each other. And so I created this, you know, uh, Waterloo co-op job placement uh, description. I pushed it out. I remember sitting on my couch at home, pushing it out. And within like a couple hours, I got hundreds of applications coming into this inbox for people I didn't know. Um, and to be honest, I didn't see Dom's come in because there was just too many. But then I looked down at my phone and I have a call from a random, you know, 905, you know, local area code number. And I answer it and he's like, hi, my name is Dominic Lau. I just applied to your, uh, you know, job application. I'm a Waterloo uh, uh, commerce business student. Um, and I was just wondering if I can talk to you about why I think I'm the perfect hire for you. And I kind of was taken back and I said, how did you get my number? And Because it wasn't on the job description. He's like, oh, I fit, found it by looking on a couple of things online. I was like, well, that's incredible. Go on. And so we started talking and learning about Dom's background, you know, growing up with two hardworking parents, you know, understanding how hard it was to get to where he was in life and similar to my upbringing as well. We, we spent over an hour talking to each other. And after that, I took the job application down and I sent him a job offer later that week. And, uh, and that was it. It was really just sort of the understanding of his background and how we jive so well together and the process at which he went to find me and call me up, especially nobody else did that. I never received any other phone calls uh, from any of the other, you know, hundreds of applicants. And so that really stood out to me. Uh, and Dom and I worked really well together. You know, in the beginning, it was him just learning who I was, what I like to do and, you know, how I like to operate. Obviously, my experience as a operator uh, had a little bit different of a flavor to it than Dom's background coming from the accounting and advisory world. But really, it wasn't fun too when COVID hit and we were kind of forced to work um, more closely, but in a remote world that Dom really shined uh, as, a, as a leader in the organization. Um, and it's been great ever since. So it's been a, a fun journey, uh, one of learning to how to work with each other. Uh, but the fellowship really was an idea that Dom had uh, in his brain that came to me with, you know, the concept. And I was very excited and passionate about it because I too grew up, you know, with not a lot of opportunities presented to me, but fortunate enough to have a couple of people that were able to give me a chance. I did a co-op placement, you know, where I got to work for the bank. And again, that was through, you know, being able to network um, and just knowing how a lot of other students who were much smarter than I was were not given those opportunities because of the lack of network or community that they could leverage, this was our opportunity to build something that could help, you know, some of the best and brightest students in our country get access to a very closed door ecosystem like venture capital or private equity, uh, and then be a, you know, a stepping stone for them to launch an incredible career. And as Dom mentioned, it, it has already translated into meaningful dollars and careers for some of the, you know, the brightest students in this country. So Matt, you, I mean, you started uh, really from scratch, right? I mean, uh, it, you uh, were a founding investor in a, in a startup, uh, and prior to that, you worked on Wall Street, so you worked in sort of uh, finance as well, but then you turned that into more of an entrepreneurial sort of lens by investing in the startup, and you had an exit, a great exit from that startup. Then you started doing angel investing, and you got a 6x return, which is excellent, that's superb, right? 
And then you started uh, decide to become an institutional investor with Fund One, and you were learning through this process, and then you onboard uh, Dom and Fund Two. So because you have this broad experience, and the audience doesn't have this experience, can you tell the difference between being an investor versus uh, uh, being a VC versus private equity? I mean, what are these different? What do these terms mean? Right. So, yeah, I, I look, I, I think we're very transparent with a lot of uh, people who come across the ecosystem, especially in the last few years where we saw a lot of tourist investors. I say the, the hardest thing that people need to understand is anyone can be an investor. It's very easy to invest. I mean, anyone calls you up and says, hey, I'm building a new widget company. Would you like to invest? And then you invest and you put it on your LinkedIn profile. I'm an investor. That's very easy. The hard part is actually being a portfolio manager of investments and knowing how to return capital. Returning capital as an investor is the hardest thing to do. And the reason why it's even harder in venture capital, let alone private equity, is because there is no liquid market. You can't just choose when you want to sell. There is no clear path to how you will find liquidity or a buyer for that asset. And there's a lot of reasons why that asset should go to zero very, very quickly before it even gets liquidity. So whatever you think in your head of why this will be successful often isn't the reason why it's successful. Uh, even though we, we want to believe that, that we're very smart and we can predict the you know, success of, uh, of uh, investments, it doesn't work out that way. And so having the ability to manage your emotional intelligence as well as your ability to understand how things are out of your control, but doing all the things you can to make sure something doesn't fall off the rails is what our job entails. So Dom and the team are tasked with not only finding great founders who are working on very technical problems, but after we make the investment, we do a lot more of the work. 90% of the work happens after the investment, not before. And so a lot of people just think if I invest, it will take care of itself. You know, they, these aren't, you know, uh, these aren't bonds. These aren't like interest bearing uh, assets that you can just sit back and click coupons. It's not real estate. You know, these are very uh, fragile uh, startups. And so a lot of the work that we have to do happens after the investment. And I think a lot of people underestimate that. So let me kind of summarize for the audience what, what, what I think I'm hearing. And then uh, Matt, you can make some corrections. So what I'm hearing is uh, an angel investor, just somebody who invests, right? And you see something interesting, you just put your money in and you just see what happens. And then when you become an institutional investor, which it has some regulatory sort of pressures around it, um, like a venture capital uh, investor, you're very early in the sense that the co company isn't necessarily established and it has a lot of repeat revenue and so on. So you're may really making a bet and probably the check sizes are smaller. That is the investment you're making is smaller. And you're actually managing money of people who are investing in your fund. So a fund is you have your own money in, but you have other people's money in. And you're indicating that 90% of the work is after you make the investment to kind of shepherd and help manage and, 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 uh, and advise the startup because they don't have a lot of experience often, right? To, to try to be successful in, in different ways. Now that differentiates you from private equity, which is much later stage. The company's already has revenue in, they're kind of established already. And then you're putting in much larger amounts of money uh, to try to grow that company. So it's a, it's, it's a different kind of mindset. Uh, and then versus sort of investing in the public markets, like, you know, just in stocks and so on, and just different mindset. Did I capture that right, what you were indicating there? Yeah, I would say it's not only just a different mindset, it's actually a different structure altogether. You know, with venture capital investments, you're a minority investor on a cap table with many cooks in the kitchen. So you're not buying, you know, 50% or more of a business. Private equity typically buys a majority of a business, takes control of it sometimes puts in their own management team and they own the asset with some leverage on top of it. With venture capital, you're buying five, 10, 15, maybe 20% of a business, but there's other investors around the table. There's the founders usually still in the business, especially at the time we're investing that stick around for a lot longer. And you're buying, uh, you're putting money in typically on a primary transaction, meaning you're putting money into the treasury of the business to be invested into resources, employees, and things like that. With private equity, you're buying out 
the founders or the existing investors, and then putting in primary capital, working capital on top of it, and then trying to grow the business, maybe 20, 30% year over year. It depends you know, what kind of business it is. And in public markets, you have no say for the most part on what happens with the business. Unless you're a large, large pension fund or institutional investor or activist investor, you're barely even buying you know, a couple percent of a business. You are obviously taking the publicly reported information on their quarterly reports and their, you know, their 10Q filings or whatever it is the, the you know, filings are, and using that to determine what the future cash flows or in, you know, outcomes of that business are, unless you're you know, different types of strategies. But that's basically the difference. So for us, we have to be okay with being a minority investor, doing a lot of the work, and not knowing what the outcome will be for the most part, because it's going to be so far in the future. And then when that outcome happens, working your ass off to get that liquidity out of the business, meaning finding a buyer or negotiating a secondary transaction. These are all the things that have to be done to get liquidity out of the business because not everybody can sell at the same time. You know, in private equity, you buy at the you know, same time, you sell at the same time, usually, because the whole company trades. But in our situation, there's so many different paths. There's only one way to invest mostly, you know, and there's many ways to sell. So it's a, it's a very different mindset for sure. So Dom, because you started this uh, Ripple X uh, fellowship program, you would have a good lens of what makes for a successful entrepreneur, you know, what, and then what makes for a team of entrepreneurs to do a startup as, as founders. So what are those attributes that make for success? Yeah, we talk about this a lot and we were even discussing this yesterday together, Matt and I. Um, it really comes down to having a balance uh, in that co-founding team. Uh, you have to have someone to be able to build the technology. So you, that's CTO. But you also have to have to have a bulldog, what we describe. Some bulldog, kind of like founder sales expert that goes out and just hustles and talks to as many customers as possible to validate that problem space that they're trying to go after at the stage we're investing. So that is the perfect kind of recipe of that team that we're looking for. Someone who can go out there, hustle, get the customer insights and feedback, and then implement it through working with the CTO or like a technical co-founder to actually build that product and then continuing to iterate. The characteristics that we're looking for is that hustle, that curiosity, that passion for that problem space, um, as well as the persistence and the iteration that they're going after to continuing to um, develop on that problem thesis, uh, be open to taking feedback and um, I guess like results from that customer and sometimes they're wrong, but also be coachable from them and then implement and just continue going on. So Dom, in your experience then, do you find that uh, people who have uh, prior experience makes a difference. Let's say they did operate some kind of other startup and then they're maybe it failed, but they're trying again. Or do you find that people who are really kind of new at the game, but but really uh, willing to just work, you know, 24 seven, putting all their energy in? I mean, or what what is what are some additional components of that sort of personal uh, background that you think makes for success in a startup? Yeah, I, I think. Some funds actually even fully anchor on only backing repeat founders or seasoned executives. Uh, but some of our best portfolio companies matter, like, like for example, Voiceflow. Voiceflow, none of them had real corporate experience. All of them had a failed startup prior to starting Voiceflow individually. And they came together to start this new company together. Um, and they had no, on paper, basically nothing that any other VC fund would look for. And they were one of our best companies in fund one. Um, same thing with Rose Rocket. Like Justin and the team, all of them kind of didn't come from traditional corporate backgrounds, um, but they had kind of uh, previous companies before they started Rose Rocket. Um, and then we have other companies where they are seasoned executives, like they were at like the Airbnb, JP Morgans of the world, uh, and then they started their next businesses. So I think you can build awesome companies uh, from different backgrounds. I think it comes down to the person and the network and the experience stuff definitely helps accelerate success. But from our view and why we started the fellowship and why we invest in these student founders is that we believe in the individual, regardless of the background, regardless of the experience. You're still uh, considered an early uh, emerging fund. And usually the uh, funds one to three, are, you're considered an emerging fund. Yeah. How did you get a bank? Banks, in my mind, are quite yeah. conservative. How do you get a bank interested in investing in you? 
Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, uh, so the, the banks uh, are definitely changing from the times even when I was working there. Uh, they've always had an interest in technology and startups. Um, but I think, you know, it's only because uh, the banks have already seen sort of how fast these companies are growing. And it's important that they get in early uh, to build those relationships long term. And there's no better early stage venture fund than Ripple Ventures, in my opinion. <laughs> so, so for us, you know, it was something of a natural partnership. Um, when they started to see how early we were working with founders, how closely we were working with helping them build their businesses. And also, to be honest with you, a lot of these companies don't even have bank accounts <laughs> when we are coming in to invest. You know, we're literally writing the first check uh, and telling uh, the founders, hey, where do we send the money? And they're like, hold the phone, let me go set up a bank account. Um, it made sense for obviously, you know, the banks to want to partner with us on that. And so because we work very early, very closely, and often very uh, hard to get these companies onto a path of success, you know, it, logically, you know, the banks would want to be along for that journey. Um, and in, in finding uh, a bank like RBC, they obviously brought in a, a great team to build out their RBCX platform, uh, headed up by Sid Paquette. Uh, with John Ridiger there and uh, a couple others uh, from the old Omer's team. And they've really just taken a keen interest in helping and helping the earliest stage founders on the journey of having, you know, access to great financial resources. Uh, and so a natural partnership evolved between us and them. Now you're a Canadian based fund and yet you're, you've got in your ripple side, really a global audience are your primary sort of investment targets primarily Canadian with some American? Or are you going global as well? What's the so Matt, what's what's the sort of investment spectrum from a geography standpoint of your investments? Sure. So you know, structurally, we are 50% Canada, 50% US from a capital allocation standpoint. But as everyone probably knows in the audience, you know, COVID changed everything from where a company actually is domiciled versus where it's being built. So we can invest in any company around the world as long as they're incorporated in Canada or the U.S. So often in the U.S., it's a Delaware C-Corp or a Canadian incorporated business. Um, but they can be building anywhere in the world uh, with a team that's totally dispersed. I mean, VoiceFlow has employees all over the world. Um, and so we're not scared of having companies being built outside of North America. But we need from a regulatory uh, and from a governance standpoint, we need them domiciled in Canada and the U.S., but from, uh, you know, from our team's perspective, we love, you know, backing Canadian founders. That's where our roots are. But we also love backing American founders and having Canadian businesses selling into the U.S. or building in the U.S. Um, because obviously the market is 10 times larger. And so we have the opportunity to scale businesses faster. And there's no, you know, borders when it comes to software sales um, is most important. But the other thing, too, is the amount of talent, uh, capital, and just sort of network opportunity in the US is just also so much larger. So you're talking about corporate partners, um, investment partners, uh, and then senior talent that you wanna come in to help scale organizations is much bigger in the US. And so when we invest in companies, we often have a lot of the follow-on investors joining the rounds coming from the US market. And that's because Dom and I have built some very strong relationships on both coast you know, in the Bay Area and New York and Boston with amazing investors that we work with who follow on to our deals after we've led an early stage round. So, you know, there's these published uh, uh, sort of stats of what makes for success from a percentage standpoint. So, Dom, you know, what is it? Uh, one, one out of 100, five out of 100. And then generally, and then from your Ripple program, what do you think the percentages are the ones that you think, you know, are going to go on and do very, very well. Yeah, I think the power law is what we're talking about. Roughly, I think like, what is it, 5 to 10% um, of your portfolio is going to be in that breakout stage. Um, for most venture funds, you have like maybe 33 to 40% go from zero to one, and then the rest go in the middle of that pack. Um, but we like to break it out into quartiles. Um, so first, lowest quartile, zero to one type of exits, um, 25%, uh, between one to three X, another 25%, three to five X, another 25%, 
Um, and then that last quartile, we're looking for 10, 20, 30 X plus uh, in that portfolio. But obviously within that last quartile, you're going to have like one company that makes up majority of that um, outcome uh, in your portfolio. So that's kind of how we think about it. I don't know if Matt, you have anything else to add? Yeah, I think we are, uh, we understand how power law really accelerates the, the, you know, the gains in a portfolio, but we also want to be cognizant of not having everything else become worthless. Um, I think sometimes venture funds are okay with 90% of the portfolio going to zero uh, as long as there's one or two that make up the rest of it and more. Um, our thinking is that we don't actually believe that all the companies need to be worthless or 90% of them do. You can have ones that still generate, you know, capital returns, just not maybe, you know, the whole 10, hundred X returns. Uh, and that helps us return the investor's capital and makes the chances uh, of us getting to those, you know, three, four, five x returns on a fund a lot more likely and also easier because you don't have that drag on sort of companies going to zero faster. Um, so meaning your probability of seeing a, a better return is more likely. Uh, and we 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 love to focus on some of the leaders of you know uh, early stage investing like Fred Wilson at uh, Union Square Ventures and how they've consistently delivered uh, amazing returns. Yes, with power law outcomes, but also with not having so many zeros in a fund as well. And also focusing on ownership and entry price as being the predominant indicator for what we focus on to determine the outcome of a business. Meaning if you ha have a great entry price into a business and the company doesn't need to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to get to a successful outcome, then uh, you don't need the largest outcome for it to be meaningful to the fund. So in one of our uh, portfolio companies in fund one, you know, the company only sold for 30 odd million dollars, but we owned, you know, almost 15% of that business with not a lot of dollars invested uh, because we entered in so early and that returned half the capital on our fund. Right. And that's why I put you from a performance standpoint into one of the top performing funds already without even deploying or having a. Uh, you know, all of the exits happening. So a that, unicorn, exactly, yeah. You know, we're down to the last few minutes, so I'm now going for some, you know, recommendations you want to give to my audience. And it's a quite a diverse audience. So I do have investors and they're typically more CEOs and founders uh, in the top uh, sort of uh, viewership. And then I get sort of engineers and scientists. So, so I'll go to uh, Dom first and then uh, Matt, because you're the senior partner. I assume you're the senior partner. <laughs> Uh, you can close. So, Dom, what are, what are some final recommendations you want to give to the audience? Um, if the audience is mostly founders, I think like the only advice that we give is just uh, talk to more customers. Uh, the the amount of times that we've spoken with founders that they kind of just are building from their own personal experiences and they try to kind of shove a product down the customer's throat. Um, we see that happen too often. And even at the later stages, sometimes it happens too. Like sometimes you get good traction uh, just because you had the right kind of place, right time and the right like customer network. But if you want to go further than that, uh, you hit a wall um, and then you kind of have to go back to the drawing board. So the main piece of advice that we can give founders is to spend more time with customers. And like our best companies are talking with customers like all day long, like 10, 20 new customers all day long, spending time with their existing customers. Um, if you don't have that touch and you don't have that understanding, it's going to be very hard to build a successful business. That kind of reminds me of the sort of nine levels of investment ready, the readiness level that Steve Blank and others have put out. And you constantly have to validate, right? And you can't yeah. validate by getting customer, you know, talking to your, your customers, right? So, and getting proof, not just people telling you things, but getting proof. So I can see how that uh, makes a lot of sense. And now Matt, you know, you're, you're the senior um, operator, investor, you've had the longer career. What are your recommendations? Yeah, for the investors out there listening, I think, you know, don't confuse angel investing with venture capital or private equity investing who are running like portfolio companies. Um, I would say like, if you're interested in learning more about the space, try and reach out to people like us. We're always happy to talk and share our experiences and advice. Try to attend AGMs, you know, annual general meetings of funds that you're interested in learning more about. We invited uh, almost half the people at our AGM a couple of weeks ago in Toronto in person were made up of non-LPs. Um, and that was because we wanted to just demonstrate what it means to actually be a day-to-day -day venture capital fund. 
and the 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 process we go through uh, and all the different you know infrastructure systems we've set up to become you know the best in class um, because it's really important to not just like read an article online or you know read a headline and be like oh venture capital is a dying asset or you know tech companies are overvalued or AI is you know, all going to, you know, be a wasteful uh, investment for everyone. It's really important to get to know the people behind uh, building and investing in this asset class uh, before you make any decisions. And I think you'll be uh, very well rewarded by understanding what the best in class looks like and what sort of the sort of tourist VCs are. And we've, we've had to do that ourselves. You know, I've told the team, when we look at companies to invest in, you won't know what's good and bad until you've seen a thousand companies. If you just think the first 10, 20 companies that show up for investment with their handout are great, uh, you haven't seen enough yet. And so I say the same thing to uh, investors looking at this asset class, you know, scour the market, look for the best venture capital funds out there, uh, and you will start to see what good and great looks like versus okay and medium. Yeah, that's some great advice. And you mentioned the term LP, those are the limited partners or investors, potential investors. Well, thank you for coming in and sharing your insights with our audience. Thanks, Thanks for having Steve. us. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.